Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our online event, How to Win. My name is Alan Uzelac, and I will do my best to be a good virtual host for you today. Just a couple of introductionary words. When we came up with the idea of this online event, we were thinking what could be the topic everyone would like to know more about. It was not an easy question, but finally, we came up with the question, how to win. We believe that in whatever industry or job position you currently are, all of us are striving for victory. We are looking for a way to win. Hopefully, today's event will bring you at least one step closer to it. To have a quick start, let's go through our agenda and see today's program and what we prepared for our approximately following 60 minutes. With help from our guest speaker, Robert Budevic, who is CTO of a company called Veracomp, we will start off with an interesting client success presentation. Robert will talk about his client perspective view how medium B2B companies can digitalize the sales processes, boost sales productivity, and create a unique customer experience while using Microsoft Dynamics for sales. Before Robert starts with his presentation, I would like to mention that on the right side of your screen, you have Q&A section where you can ask questions during and after the presentation. You, you, you can ask your questions related to the presentation to which your presenter will answer in the chat format or later after the presentation finishes. Robert, I think you can start. Oh, so so I hope you can you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, we're live. Uh, as as Alan said, uh, my name is Robert Budevich. I'm uh, CTO here at Veracom Adriatics. I've been mainly in technical uh, engineering roles, from support engineer to pre-sales engineer for the last uh, like uh, two two de decades and mainly working with IT uh, enterprise solutions in the security area mostly. So that's my, my expertise. I've been kindly asked by Adacta to, to present you to, to show you how a typical uh, CRM implementation uh, might look like in a B2B uh, scenario. So I've, I've prepared a few, few slides just to go over this implementation to give you a more, more concrete uh, idea. So. Um, let me share my my desktop. Now I hope you do see the presentation now on screen. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So uh, <clears throat> basically, I'm going to run through uh, a couple of points. Uh, what who is Veracomp and to give you an overview who how we work. And then what were the challenges and issues before implementing CRM and then how how we sold it and uh, what benefits we saw with uh, C with CRM. That's basically the idea. So Veracom Group is uh, one of the largest IT distributors uh, in the Central and Eastern uh, Europe area. Uh, we distribute basically enterprise IT software and, and hardware solutions. And uh, besides uh, offering typical logistics services, which is, uh, of course, the idea of a distributor, we, we do offer uh, other services such as marketing, advanced marketing services, business development and sales, uh, pre-sales support, post-sales support. And that's why we, we, we are called a value-add dis, uh, distributor. We operate in this market called value-add distribution. On the right, you can see roughly the, the countries which we, we cover as Veracom Group, but uh, uh, the CRM implementation uh, I'm talking about is actually uh, based in uh, Veracom Patriotics, which is this uh, part of uh, Veracom Group. And this is where my, my colleagues and, and um, myself are uh, actually responsible for this, uh, for this part. So here in the Adriatics, uh, we, we cover eight countries basically ex-Yugoslavia plus uh, Albania with uh, around uh, more than 40 employees uh, spread across multiple regional offices, five regional offices, and uh, we represent about 20 or even more uh, vendors, IT, IT vendors. Uh, actually, we've been doing this uh, job since 2001 as an independent company. 
and were acquired in 2013 as uh, by by Veracom. So we've been working as part of Veracom Group since then. And as you can see on the on the timeline um, below, uh, there has been a substantial growth of both uh, vendors we represent and uh, definitely transactions, revenue, and the amount of work and everything that follows from from that. So this is one of the reasons why we are. I'm talking here about CRM, basically. Uh, so a few more details uh, to give you context. Uh, we're definitely pure B2B player. So that's the topic of this. Uh, the idea was to to actually show you a B2B scenario, and th this means we do not sell to consumers. We do not even sell to businesses who actually use the solutions, but we sell to system integrators, IT resellers who who are actually uh, the ones um, uh, implementing these solutions at, at, uh, at their customers. Our uh, job is to develop the sales channel to, to, uh, to make the resellers as much as uh, engaged as, as possible and to, to basically sell and, and implement as much as possible the, the solutions we, uh, we represent. So this is called a three-tire sales uh, sales channel, di consisting of distributor, reseller, and, and end user. As you might expect, the sales cycle here is relatively long. So we, we are not talking about uh, impulsive purchases, uh, but we really talk about projects and the stuff that, that has to be tracked for many weeks or even quarters. And uh, uh, we are doing that from many points from uh, uh, across the region, from many offices. So it's really critical for us to have this uh, situational awareness of what's going on with the sales pipeline. It is basically a long sheet of, of projects and opportunities or deals, however you want to call them. And uh, we need to know for each one of those who are the stakeholders, who is the reseller, who is the vendor, the end user, in particular, how how the probability looks like of winning this deal, and also when will be the the estimated close uh, close date. So, and basically, all these variables need to be tracked in real time. The idea is uh, to get the exact uh, uh, to have an exact idea how much business will be closed until the end of the quarter, preferably also in the next quarter, and. Uh, uh, so you, you get the general idea how uh, 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 all this has to be tracked in in uh, uh, in real time and people engineers have to basically contribute uh, data and information into this uh, into this pipeline so that we are always aware of what's going on and so um, in uh, in trying to solve these issues, see, I uh, have a couple of points how, how it looked like be before CRM, and I'm really talking about ancient history. So we've been uh, doing Excel, right? No, uh, no company runs without Excel. It's basically a spreadsheet that we needed. And at the beginning, we, we of course started with, uh, with Excel. But as you might imagine, the uh, Excel does not scale well when many people are working on it. Some people will break sheets, some Excel will crash. And as the business was growing, the number of vendors, opportunities, transactions was growing. We quickly did what uh, any other company does, and that's uh, basically migrate to a web application. Uh, at one point, this was SharePoint uh, list, uh, which is basically like an Excel sheet, but only in the uh, presented in a web browser. But that also proved very slow. So whenever we we have to do something very very often and ask our staff to do something very often, it is critical that this this be really fast. So in a second or two seconds, you have to update some something. Preferably, you must update it uh, several um, um, rows uh, at once by not clicking too much and, and really burdening our staff with too much administrative uh, work. So these were the, definitely the issues. And then with, uh, as the, the business was growing, it really became clear that uh, we have important uh, uh, information about accounts, about the companies and about the people 
which are working at those companies, the resellers, which we need to also track. And this information is dispersed uh, among our uh, sales staff, but there's really no central point where this information is vid visible. The contacts, the accounts and tied to the existing opportunities and deals uh, we, we track in the pipeline. So again, a lack, a lack of visibility is what uh, was uh, bothering us and uh, definitely slow performance and, and associated productivity uh, loss. And th this is mainly the, the situation that we that prompted us to to seek for a, uh, to search for a CRM uh, solution. So we, we went to the market. We quickly saw there are, uh, of course, uh, several um, <clears throat> alternatives um, from uh, uh, offering CRM uh, solutions. And uh, uh, we quickly realized that uh, Dynamics 365 is, or Microsoft solution is one of the uh, leading uh, CRM by, by market share. It's tried and tested among many, many other companies. So we are not reinventing the wheel here. And a couple of points just to, to give you uh, a summary of critical points that made us uh, actually, uh, that convinced us to, to go for, for Dynamics. So uh, mainly it was out of the box integration with uh, Microsoft Office tools. So as probably most of the companies in, and probably most of you, you, you know that uh, uh, you use uh, Microsoft Office tools, Excel, Outlook, and and so on, and so it's very important to to have that integration where we can even enter data, for example, from Excel or from Outlook, and uh, w without the the burden of re-entering the same data in at uh, in two points, for example, in an Excel sheet and and in parallel into, into CRM. So this integration with Microsoft's existing ecosystem is very, very important. And the other thing is uh, definitely uh, a lightweight approach. We are an SMB business, so we don't like uh, heavy infrastructure costs, uh, heavy uh, server uh, servers, uh, backup worries. Um, uh, we just want to basically to enable our staff to to work from a, from a browser. That's all that's needed, just a browser. And no VPN access, no uh, uh, that kind of uh, complicated instructions to basically set up uh, the, the, the and uh, give instructions to the to the staff to to even in, uh, to, to even enable them to, to work. And that proved uh, very, very, uh, uh, I think, uh, important in these uh, recent times when uh, we were all forced to, to work from, from home, right? So basically we realized that with this approach, we are always working r remotely. Even now when I'm in the office, I'm working remotely. There is no actually, uh, uh, office work for us. We are always connecting to a remote server in the cloud. So when we switched to home office, there was no need to, to to have any VPN access. There was no need to to plan for extra capacity of uh, internet pipe at the office because when you have a server in the office, you usually have to to plan for costly uh, internet pipe pipe upgrades and and stuff like that. So all that was basically eliminated with uh, with this approach and that is what dynamics 365 basically offers it's a SaaS offering software as a service offering pay as you go model and uh, no uh, and easy setup so you only work with the browser no extra uh, software installation is actually required and then uh, just two more points uh, what we found out is that uh, you can easily modify the application and, and adapt it uh, to your business processes without any code interventions of course of course you might need some development effort and this is why we relied on the data but uh, in in essence any change you have in the uh, uh, business process you can do it with no code interventions so basically with the visual editor you can modify the data the the forms the views the dashboards without uh, any help from from outside and so this makes us very very um, uh, flexible and very fast to when whenever we needed to change something in the application and that's a very very good feature and lastly what we've also uh, found out that um, many users 
in inside the, the organizations, our staff can really help themselves by building their own uh, views, the, the way they want to the information to be presented, maybe export data into the, the tools they like, such as Excel. We've even discovered that we have uh, Power BI experts uh, between our staff because uh, people could easily export data into uh, a BI tool and really analyze it uh, in a more advanced uh, uh, way. So uh, basically no need to, to, to have costly uh, development efforts uh, for each and every uh, change. That, that these were the, actually, uh, I would say, the crucial points uh, why we've, we've chosen uh, 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 Dynamics. And just to give you a couple of screenshots to, to explain what's uh, what we've achieved. So here you see I had to mask the, the numbers, sorry about that. But here you, you see the kind of operational visibility you, you get. So here is the, the timeline of opportunities uh, uh, split by quarters and uh, uh, the screenshot has been taken in Q2. So in Q2 you can see a blue a column which shows the opportunities which are still in the pipeline, they are open and we are uh, trying to get them closed as, as one. And on the other hand, you have the orange bar which shows the one opportunity, so the past business that has been realized. And, and of course, you can drill in and, and do then the analysis based on that. And you can always change the parameters without any extra development. So for example, here I, I've chosen um, uh, the probability to include only opportunities which have the probability of 40% and above. And, uh, but I could have easily changed that to something else. Then you, you have the visualization such as the famous sales funnel. Uh, uh, you can always dr drill in by clicking on a particular probability band. Here we see the basically the amount of uh, deals which are split according to their probabilities of, of getting, uh, getting one. Then uh, another example is what I was telling you before, uh, uh, the, the ability to easily export data to, to the familiar tools such as here uh, uh, Microsoft Excel, right? And then also to re-enter that data in Excel and uh, uh, put it back into CRM. That is very, very uh, uh, important and, uh, and a great feature. So people are very used, our sales and everybody's actually uh, naturally used to, to be dealing with spreadsheets and, and that's that's okay. Basically, we, we empower users to do that. Then you can consume the same data which Dynamics makes you available from other tools. And that was uh, very uh, beneficial for us in management to actually consume this data from a Power BI tool and uh, make much more advanced analytics. Uh, usually that was uh, reserved for, I would say, uh, larger uh, enterprises. Now it's easily available for SMB businesses as well uh, at a fraction of, uh, of a cost, I would say. And finally, a screenshot of an email where actually I'm using uh, Outlook, uh, where actually you, are, you can uh, track the email or an appointment, a meeting, and uh, uh, link it to a particular event in, in Dynamics. Uh, for example, to, a, to an opportunity, you can tie an email or an appointment to an account, to a contact uh, and so on. The point is that you are not re-entering data into CRM, you're just linking existing data in CRM. So we're not making any burden on the, on the staff to re-enter uh, data, which is, uh, tends to be very uh, uh, problematic. And, and the important note here is that, you, again, no extra installation is required. The button you, you see here on the right, which is uh, uh, circled in red, right, is automatically provisioned when you enable the Dynamics license. So no extra installation and the ability to actually link data and no re-entering data into CRM. And basically, that's uh, that's it. The, the, these are the the main benefits we've uh, seen in the testing phase, and also, of course, in the implementation phase. The only thing that uh, left was uh, actually choose an implementation partner who will follow, who will guide us how to who uh, to implement this. We uh, quickly found that Duct is quite uh, quite good and has a great track record across diverse industries. Uh, also, also B two B. But what was more important, whenever we had a question about a very 
specific and practical questions about our business processes, they immediately knew how to translate this into Dynamics 365, which I think uh, demonstrated uh, us that they, they simply know what, what they are doing. They have uh, great experience and uh, all in all, I, I think it has been uh, uh, definitely a win, win win situation for, for us. Now, uh, uh, we are in the post sales phase. We, uh, I can also uh, say that their sale, uh, technical support is really also great, professional, and uh, uh, and I think we've we've chosen well. So basically, I'm not sure how much uh, time I, I took. I hope you have now an idea how, in this uh, brief time, how uh, typical CRM implementations look looking b2b scenario uh, thanks very much thank you for your attention and if there are any questions i am uh, more than happy to answer them before we get started just a little disclaimer from my side i just wanted to emphasize that today's presentation is based on demo information and should be treated like this having in mind all its limitations. In today's demo, we plan to show you a high level overview of how we in Adapta use Microsoft Stack. So we're talking about Dynamics 365 for Sales, Outlook, Teams, and LinkedIn Sales Navigator to discover, contact, and engage our potential B2B customers. As you can see in this first part of today's demo, we will show you how you can find and engage new potential clients for your business using LinkedIn Sales Navigator. In 2020, a lot of sales teams over different industries are facing the same challenge, and that is the lack of new leads and new opportunities, since meeting new people minimized due to measures of social distancing and lockdowns. Postponement of basically all business events and conferences surely did not help as well. Now, one of the ways to tackle this ongoing challenge is by using LinkedIn Sales Navigator. It is the premium version of LinkedIn, which we all know is globally biggest business database for both companies and people you want to connect to and stay in touch. We are looking about, we are talking about more than 675 million people using LinkedIn in 2020. Basically, what it lets you to do is find highest quality leads. a lot more efficiently than the basic version of LinkedIn. So let's jump into it. When I log into my LinkedIn Sales Navigator, I have a new speed, something similar like you have in the regular LinkedIn, but with, with some changes. Here, as you can see, I have alerts, and these alerts are about, are about activities that my leads or my accounts are doing. What does that mean? That means that if a person or company that is not in your network, both something you can see how to find those leads and accounts where you can search for them or you can apply some filters to do that. So I can filter for my leads and I can filter for my accounts. For purpose of today's demo, I will try to find my ideal company, my ideal client. First thing you need to do is figure out what your ideal client looks like. The best way to do that is to look at clients that you already have, seeing what things they have in common in terms of industry they are based in and their company size. Who you actually spoke to when you close them? Are you targeting owners, manage, managing directors, IT managers, or for example, chief sales officers? And then actually trying to draw things in common between your ideal clients and then looking for the potential new ones using advanced search. So for example of today's demo, I will be looking for companies that are doing hospitality business. So I can search first by industry and input hospitality. And also I can add travel and tourism. You will see as I apply each of those filters, the number of total results will lower down. That is good because that means that I'm getting more precise and more focused search. Next thing I can do is filter by geography. So 
So I would like to start with Adriatic region, that means Croatia, Slovenia, and Serbia, and maybe expand it with Dark region as well. So we'll go with Germany, Austria, and of course Switzerland. Next thing you have is keywords. I'm looking for hospitality accounts, so I will put hospitality keyword. Next thing I like to do is filter by company headcount. This basically gives you buckets of companies in terms of their size and number of employees. So I will choose all companies that have between 50 and 5,000 employees and get 203 results in total, which is a number that is okay for me. But if, for example, the number of total results would be still too high, what I can do is I can apply other advanced features and filters to lower it. For example, I can use both growth of both company headcount and department headcount or annual revenue. So by now I know what kind of accounts I'm looking for in terms of size, market, and industry they are in. And we can click search. What we get next is our account results. Now, on the left-hand side, I still have my filters, which I could easily remove if I want to, or add a new one. Now, maybe we are already talking to or are doing business with some of those companies from this search for result. What you do next is you save the ones that you would like to engage with. For the purpose of this demo, I already saved some of those companies, and you have the only view button for the ones that I saved. But just to show you how this is really easy, I could add new one, for example, this one, I add it to my list. And immediately I get a notification that this has been done. So out of this, I will create my account lists for the companies that I want to do business with. How to find them, you just go under lists, account lists, and there you have it. These are the 14 companies that I want to focus on. Now, as a next step, we want to discover our target audience from these saved account lists. So we need the right person from each of those companies. What we do next is we get into account and we see total number of employees that have a LinkedIn profile. We click there and what we can do is find our perfect match using filters like, for example, function. I want to talk to sales team and seniority level, I'm interested in directors and senior salespeople. Now I'll get total result of three, and as you see, three of them are already saved. Again, I did this just to speed things up. But just to show you how this is very easy, I could add a new person and add it to my list. Immediately get the notification about it, and if I go to lead lists, I will see that these are the seven persons, seven people that I want to engage with. So at this moment, we know who our potential new clients are and we can start communicating with them. Even though they can be in third tier of our network, with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, we can write them one-to-one -one personalized email message. Also, as we saw on my homepage, we can receive regular updates on my news feed using alerts. So whenever a change happens, for example, a new person is hired in the company from our list, one of your leads posts something on LinkedIn or gets a promotion to a new position within a company or externally, we can get those alerts and updates on a weekly basis. Also, we can send these leads into Dynamics 365 and track all activities and communication we will have with them. Last but not least, LinkedIn Sales Navigator knows your search preferences and interests and uses them so its algorithm and artificial intelligence can recommend you additional leads accordingly to them. So just to, as a wrap up for this first part of today's demo, I'm going to underline the biggest benefits we saw for using LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So today we saw how to generate more leads from focus industry, one that you want to open as a new industry, or to find similar leads from industry where you already have a footprint in. How to find and communicate to the right decision makers from those companies, even if they are outside of your current LinkedIn network using LinkedIn email. 
how to stay up to date with any changes and activities that your targeted decision makers or companies you have a focus on are doing. How LinkedIn uses AI for recommended leads regarding your saved preferences. Now we can go to the next part of today's demo, and this is of course Dynamics 365, so I will switch to this tab. Here we will show you what happens next in our sales process. In the first part of today's demo, we saw how to find and start communicating where, with our ideal potential client. We can call that the beginning of the sales process, the first step. Now we will show you how Dynamics 365 for sales with usage of MS Teams and Outlook can help you with managing the sales process from day one until closed one deal. A couple of words before we proceed with the demo. When working with our clients, our goal is to give added value in a modern workplace with collaboration in distributed teams, sales teams, and all colleagues coming from different departments that are collaborating on the same opportunity while maximizing the conversion rate from potential customer to your loyal client. In the digital era, we are all bombarded with information, short of attention and driven to distraction. Sellers are not immune. When you look at the numbers today, sales professionals work per each deal with an average of 6.8 stakeholders and 16 colleagues. That is a lot. That means longer and more complex sales cycles. There are on twice as many teams as they were a few years back and they are constantly on the go, making it harder for teams to collaborate. Today, you will see that while using Microsoft Stack, modernizing of seller productivity has never been easy. So let's start. On home screen, each user can see its important information in one place with the dashboards. Today, we'll be showing salesperson perspective, but really each of your users can have a different home screen and dashboard outline accordingly to its role inside your organization, whether he or she is sales manager, sales representative, marketing or a customer service person. So everything you see, all the dashboards are perfectly adjustable for each user role. Dashboards give you the big picture and let you drill down to the details of every relationship, never a deal. You can start your day with a picture of the entire sales pipeline. To quickly see which customer or opportunity needs attention. For example, you can jump into specific lead or specific opportunity right here from the dashboard. Now, let us imagine that from my lead lists of the ideal potential clients that we created in previous step in LinkedIn Sales Navigator, I have started talking to one of them. For the purpose of this demo, the potential client will be myself, so Alan, because we have to share some private information as well, and I will be in role of salesperson called Matesh. So I started talking to Alan via LinkedIn Sales Navigator. As a next step, we can automatically create and fill out his contact profile, so for Alan as a person, an account profile, so of his company, Adapta, to have a unique 360 view in Dynamics 365. So let's see, if I go under contacts, I will have my contact lists here. And if I click on Alan, I will open Alan's 360 view, something that I already did just to save us time and to have all the data inside of it. Now, if we take a look at his contact 360 view, we can see his summary tab and a lot of other tabs. But in the summary tab, we have contact information on the left hand side with all the data. So we have his first name, last name, job title, company that he works for, and his uh, contact information about it. Also, we can see activities timeline in the middle. This is all the activities that I have with this person. Either I send emails, I have phone calls with him, I have appointments, so everything can be tracked here. Also, in real life scenario, in this place, we would have tracked our initial LinkedIn chat thread. But since the demo environment has some limitations, we do not have LinkedIn chat history tracked to show it here. But this is something that we typically do, do, do out of the box during implementation. If we click on LinkedIn Sales Navigator, we will see 
member profile of this person. So I will have summary of Alan's LinkedIn profile. And also I will have account profile so I can see for which company Alan does. And you can see that member profile and account profile can be saved in Sales Navigator, something that we saw earlier today and can be added to both account lists and lead lists. The third thing I have is LinkedIn email. That means that right here from Dynamics, I can write Alan a LinkedIn email without leaving Dynamics. Another scenario possible is that if I have not reached out to Alan earlier, I could use some of the additional functionalities I have here for warm introduction, since integration with LinkedIn empowers sellers with the insights they need to win even faster. Like in example, icebreakers or search connections I have with this person and who can help make a warm introduction. Leveraging this valuable information, sellers can deliver more personalized and targeted engagements that resonate with buyers. If I go back to summary tab, I will see that now I have Alan as a contact in Dynamics and can take a look at his 360 view. Additionally, let's imagine that Alan told me that he has a new project assigned to him to browse the market and decide which CRM to implement for internal needs. Alan plans to prepare an RFP and send the document documentation to me via email. Now, with this information, I can open a new lead in the M365. So what I do, I go to my lead lists and I open the one for Alan. So I have the topic here, CRM for Adacta, because I know that they will be searching for new CRM. And as you can see, it has very similar outline as Contact 360 with summary tab consisting of contact information on the left hand side and activities timeline in the middle. Additionally, it has also stakeholders and competitors information to the right hand side, which gives you insights on key person as well as key competitors you will meet while working on this deal. Above it, we have so-called business process flow, which consists of four stages or four phases. Now this can be very easily configured, which means that the number and the name of phases can be edited and adjusted to your sales process really easy and quickly. In the same time, you can determine what actions need to be fulfilled to make it possible to go to the next phase. So for example, if I click on, on this phase, I will see all things I need to do to, to click next stage. Business process flow is a very nice way to know how many leads you have in each sales phase and how close are you to closing them. So did you just started talking to them? Are you developing or proposing something for them? Or are you in the phase to close the deal? Above it in the right upper corner, you can see useful additional information like lead source, where did this lead came from? A rating, is it cold, warm or hot? Status. This means, is it a new lead or already contacted lead? And of course, the owner. So who inside your organization is the primarily contact for this lead? Also, you can add activities, clicking the plus button. So you can add mail, call, task, or appointment, basically anything that happens during the sales process, and it will stay on the lead timeline. You will have it written here. So let's imagine that after our initial contact, was made, Alan sends me an official inquiry via email and invites me to attend the RFP a doctor has prepared. I will just switch, I will just switch to my inbox in Outlook and see that Alan's mail has already landed in my inbox. Now, just a few words about Dynamics 365 app for Outlook. This app works for both web client and desktop client. Main reason to use it is to connect your Outlook and Dynamics 365 with the benefit of eliminating the need to switch between email and CRM solution, saving even more time and effort. Let's see some of the advantages of using both of them. When I click on this blue Dynamics 365 button, a Dynamics 365 screen opens inside of Outlook. So basically, I'm working in Dynamics while never leaving Outlook, which is pretty useful. This screen can also be pinned 
which I know a lot of our clients do use in this way because they just like using Dynamics 365 throughout of as well. From here, we have several different options available to us, like add, update, edit, and create contacts, accounts, leads, and tasks, as well as see person's LinkedIn profile and send LinkedIn email directly from Outlook. Now, since Alan is already existing contact in my Dynamics 365, the system automatically re recognizes him as a sender of this email and shows some details from 360 view, like his contact details, account details, so the company that he works for, and we can see that we have an open lead for Alan. If this was not the case, with one click, I could quickly add Alan into Dynamics 365 without leaving out and Outlook would even automatically fill out some field. For example, name, surname, email, and so on. Additionally, with one easy click, I can track any email directly from Outlook to a lead in Dynamics 365, so that every next reply to this initial mail automatically gets saved in, for an example, open lead I have with that specific client. So. What is happening here is that this mail is being linked back to lead timeline in Dynamics 365 that we saw just moments ago. Again, to save us time, this is something that I already did before, so you can see that this mail is being tracked. But just to show you how this is real easy, I will just track this other, other mail, even though it is not entirely connected to this lead. And in a few seconds, I will get a notification that is successfully tracked. Now, if I go back to lead and I just refresh it, you will see that the email that I just tracked is here on the timeline. So now I have a potential client. I have his 360 view in dynamics. I open, I open the new lead and I have received RFP details. Next thing to do is start my internal process using Microsoft Teams and gather the right team to win this deal and bring it home. Above the lead, you will see Teams Collaborate button where you connect your lead with a Teams group or channel, which will be used primarily for communicating internally for this particular lead. This needs to be done just once per each lead before you start using it so that all the data regarding this lead is synced in both solutions Again, something that I already did to save time for today's demo, but it's basically a couple of clicks away. If I switch to Microsoft Teams, I will see that I have a couple of things here. Now, just a few words about MS Teams. Teams is used as and known as a collaboration app that helps teams to stay organized and have conversations, both chat, audio call, and video call all in one place. We started using MS Teams internally and externally, basically from day one when they appeared on the market with immediate positive impact on our business. Additional step forward and added value was during work from home and lockdown phase, when they really made it easy for all of us to stay on track and to seamlessly work together on new and existing projects. Now you will see here under Teams logo, I can see a list of all the teams I'm part of. Teams can be public or private and are made out of channels. You can build them by topic, department, or just for fun. Channels are where, where the real work gets done, where you hold meetings, have team conversations, and share files. At the top of each channel, you will find tabs. So we have posts. Here we can chat or tag a person. You have files. So here we can save all the files files that are important for us for this particular RFP. We have wiki, which can be, of course, some notes from our meeting. And we have a couple of additional tabs that I added. So I have Alan as a lead and I have his company as Company360 View. So you can look at this lead directly from Teams which means that I can, I, I can be working in the dynamics while never leaving Microsoft Teams with the benefit of eliminating the need to switch between Microsoft Teams and CRM solution, saving even more time and effort. Whatever I decide to change or update on this particular lead will be 
automatically updated in Dynamics 365 as well. So that means that the whole team can be working on the exact same file, which I can save here with no need to have multiple versions of the same document locally saved. These same files are being centrally saved on SharePoint and can be reached via Dynamics as well under this lead. So you do not need to worry about not finding the RFP documentation and having multiple versions of an example quote that your team is working on. To sum it up, while using Microsoft Teams, sellers can reach out internally to tap into subject matter experts across the organization and stay organized throughout the journey to quickly and easily build more effective client-facing proposal and win more deals. Now, if I just go back to Alan's lead, you will see in the upper right corner that I have go to website. If I click on it, it will take me straight back to our lead in Dynamics 365. Now, as we work closely with our team and our potential client on the next phases that we have in our sales process, we can go through each of these phases. We can add tasks and add reminders for, for both internal to-dos as well as the ones that are agreed with the potential plan. When finalizing an opportunity, you can close it as won or lost, and the end result will be updated on your dashboard of your pipeline that we saw on our home screen. Okay, so that is as far as we are going to go for today with our demo presentation. I honestly hope this gives you a high level of just some of the capabilities available within the sales model of Dynamics 365. And again, we are just scratching the surface of, of what you can do out of the box. Before proceeding to our next presentation, I would like to mention a couple of things. In today's demo, we saw LinkedIn Sales Navigator, Microsoft Teams, Outlook, and last but not least, Dynamics 365 for sales, which is basically only one of the apps available in Microsoft customer engagement solution. Other ones are covering business, different business areas, such as marketing, customer service, field service, and project service automation, which can be implemented standalone or added later if you decide to start with Dynamics 365 for sales. To wrap it up, we have seen today Microsoft Stack as a simple way to close more deals and boost productivity, to cut through complexities and focus on what is most important with contextual real-time dashboards that show you which metrics to focus on so you can take informed and consistent action towards the organization's specific goals. Your sales manager can monitor ongoing performance. Easy to use dashboards show sales leaders when a team member needs help or when it is time to celebrate a big win. With easy to access reports, you will know who your best customers are and be able to get your sales teams quickly focused on prospects with the greatest potential for long-term growth. With a holistic view of customers, you get context to tailor every customer interaction. Clear guidance directly inside sales records gives you specific steps needed to move a deal forward as you work. Streamlined workflows right out of the box with sales capabilities that work with familiar tools like Office 365, LinkedIn, and Teams. Work anytime, anywhere, across web, smartphones and tablets, irrelevant if you are in your office or on the go. You can go across platforms, including Windows, Android, and Apple. Co-author winning proposals with your team in real time with tools you already know how to use. Start with just what you need now, then easily add capabilities as your business grows. With little to no technical skills, configure Dynamics 365 for sales for your specific sales process. With the power to simplify and easily scale and adapt to future needs, quickly overcome distraction, regain focus, and build sales momentum using Dynamics 365 for sales. What will be the end result of it? You will have stronger proposals created in less time, delivered to leads who are primed for conversion, and powered by the unparalleled connection between Dynamics Office and LinkedIn. Close integration with Office 365 means you collaborate in a familiar environment and capture customer communication history without leaving the flow of what you're doing. You can access Dynamics data, 
directly from Outlook using the Dynamics 365 app for Outlook. Keep, keep pace with the evolving customer demands. Use Dynamics 365 for sales to close more deals faster and drive trans more transformative business results. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, we are going to do something that I wanted to do for a very long time, and that is uh, make an analysis of, uh, of a historical battle from a managerial perspective. So we are going to try to think as the decision makers on that fateful day tried to think. My name is Oleg Mastruko. I'm usually, my regular job is the editor of uh, IT magazine Mreja. We also organize some events and conferences. But this is something that does not belong to this category. You hear me? Okay, Eva? Okay, I will assume that you hear me uh, uh, correctly. because We can hear you, yeah, great. Yeah, okay. So we are going to analyze the Battle of Lepanto. This is probably one of the most important historical battles, and it was uh, uh, people from uh, our uh, regions were involved in it, uh, from Dalmatia and also from Slovenia, Copper and, uh, and, uh, and the parts of the coast that belonged to Venice at that time. The historical situation uh, was like this, roughly like this. Ottoman Empire was huge, was very united, and it was expanding towards Europe. Europe was not united. Uh, it was uh, made of some <laughs> small states that had their own interests. Probably the strongest one were Spain. This is a typo here. It should be Spain, of course. Spain, do, do you see the mouse uh, cursor? Do you see the, the, the mouse thing? Or just yep. the picture? Do yes, yes, we do. We do. Okay. Excellent, thank you. So Spain was probably the most important and strongest power in Europe at that time, along with Portugal. Other states were disunited. Venice was very small. It was important uh, as a merchant state, but in military sense, it was not very strong. The war in uh, 1571 started about Cyprus. Cyprus was Venetian territory, and as you see, it was also the Crete was Venetian territory, and Cyprus was Venetian territory, and the Ottoman Empire obviously wanted to take Cyprus because it was in the middle of their, what they perceived as their sea. They started the siege of Cyprus and then the Pope, I don't know the name of the Pope at that time, but the Pope was very much involved in organizing the allied European front against the Ottomans. That was a problem in itself because organizing uh, various separate European entities to fight against Ottomans was not easy because they were all about their separate interests and everything. But he was very determined, so he organized the Allied fleet to counter the Ottomans. They, after they organized, they started to move towards Cyprus, and the decisive battle of Lepanto was fought here in this red square, because it was on the way as they assembled in the Mediterranean waters and they started to move towards Cyprus. This was on their way and the Ottoman fleet was waiting for them here. The main fighting thing of those times in the Navy was the galley, Gallia or galley. There are three components of galley that you have to keep in mind. The galley has the ability to fire only directly in front. It has, it's not like a line ship that you see in the Napoleonic times or whatever. It has one big gun centrally mounted. You cannot aim it. You can only aim it by moving the whole ship not not aim it individually more or more than a couple of degrees towards the left or right. It also had a couple of smaller guns to the left and right, but depending on the galley, some galleys had only one gun, centrally mounted, able to fire directly in front. Then it had the infantry component. Infantry component was just the fighting infantry, because when the galleys clashed, it was supposed that the infantry will fight. And it also had the rowers, the people who rowed the oars. And there is a very, very important thing about the rowers that we will come to lately. So remember those three components, firing only centrally towards the front, infantry component on the ships and the rowers. 
This is another picture of the galley, the one that I made in the museum in Barcelona. You still hear me okay? Everything going fine, technically? Eva? Yes, yes, everything is okay. Okay, okay. So, as you see again, there are hours, there are infantry components in the middle and the guns in the front. So the fight at Lepanto, 1571. Holy League was led by Don Juan of Austria. He was a Spaniard from Spain. Why Austria? Because Habsburgs uh, then controlled the Austria and the Spain. It was the Habsburg dynasty. Uh, they had 202 galleys and six galleasses. We'll come to galleasses a bit later because it's a very important strategic thing to this whole thing. Ottoman fleet was larger. It was 216 galleys and 64 galleots. Galleots are like small galleys. They are also called fustas in some in some literature. So the Holy League, why the Spaniard was commanding the Holy League? Because, uh, because the components, because the European allies were very disunited, some of them hated each other. For instance, Genoese hated Venetians, Venetians hated Genoese and the Spaniards. Everybody hated the Napoleons from the Naples, Napoli. So it was very disunited, and as a, as a, when the Pope organized the Holy League as a kind of a compromise, he decided to put the Spaniard as a commander, because this is the only commander that nobody would have any complaints about. If he put a Venetian as a commander, then the Genoese would not participate. If he put, you get the point. So basically, the European Christian side was smaller and weaker. Now, let us try to think, this whole presentation is more or less from the side of the Holy League, from the European League, uh, because it's more interesting and more challenging, and it's <laughs> also it's closer to us as Croatians, Slovenians and Europeans. Challenges from the perspective of the Holy League, the, mo the most important challenges were this. This is the managing of multinational fleet. It was not, it was, as I said, very disunited with some components being very hateful against each other. Venetian Genoese rivalry was probably the most pronounced of those, um, those hatreds in, in the fleet. And also the numerical inferiority, because you have actually a weaker fleet with all these components combined. Advantages from the perspective of the Holy League commander. That is the Spanish inf infantry, which was best in the world at that time. Spanish infantry was loaded as an infantry component on all galleys in the Holy League. Not only the Spanish galleys, but also the Venetian galleys carried Spanish infantry. The Genoese galleys, everybody carried as much Spanish infantry as possible because it was the best trained infantry of the world. Galeasses, which we will come to later, were a very important strategic advantage and very inventive for the time. The third advantage was rovers able to fight if necessary. Now I have to explain this because um, in, in Croatia, thanks to Nazor, Vladimir Nazor, and thanks to some other authors, there is a belief that the Venetian rovers were slaves, like carried in chains or anything. But this is a lie. This is a, this is a lie that Nazor uh, placed for his <laughs> own interests. But the actual truth is that the, for the Venetian side, the rovers were free people. It was not a great job. It was like a job for, uh, you know, the sweeper of the streets, Metlar. <laughs> it, it's, it's not the best paid or, or, or the best job in the world, but it was actually a job for free men. They were not slaves. On the Ottoman side, we actually had slaves and uh, Christian slaves and, uh, and uh, prisoners of war. So why is this important? This is important because if uh, as, the, as the Americans say, if the shit hits the fan, on the Venetian side, the rowers, the people who row the oars, Veslaci, will be able to fight if necessary. If pushed, they will fight because they are free men, they are Venetians, they will not run away. On the Ottoman side, the rowers will not fight because they are Christian slaves, they will try to escape. <laughs> okay, so the motivation for the rowers is, is, is one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, about. Christian rovers will maybe fight, Ottoman rovers will not fight, they will try to escape, but they will also, their motivation is for their ship not to sink because they are chained to the ship and they will sink with the ship. 
Technically going okay, Eva? Yes, I think we are good. Okay. So the Galas. Galas was one of the most important advantages for the Holy Fleet, uh, Allied Fleet. It was like a big or a larger galley. And as I said, galleys had the ability only to fire in front. Galas has like this big tower in Pro, na Provi. This round tower has like seven or eight cannons that are able to fire on all sides. Very big and important advantage uh, com compared to the galley, which fires only towards the front. Galleas is where uh, road. The, the, the Venetians had six galleases. They divided them two on the right flank, two on the left flank, two in the center. They were supposed to go in front of the fleet to disrupt the oncoming Ottoman line. This is another view of the galleys with the tower in front, so you can see the difference between this and the photograph uh, of the of the galley with 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 the cannons able to fire only towards the front. This was the disposition on that fateful day. So the blue ones are the Ottoman galleys. Galleys fought in line because they are able to fire only towards the front. So they just there is very simple tactics where they just uh, put themselves in line. And uh, and it's like this, and all the fleets, the, the both fleets had like, let's consider it from the Christian side, left flank, center, and the right flank. Now, as the as the Christians were coming from the north, they were deploying first the left flank, then the center. This is the reserve. Reserve is also very important. Left flank, center, reserve, right flank. Right flank had the longest to row, so they were slowest to deploy. And as you can see, these are the galleasses that I mentioned. They were rowing in front of the line to disrupt the Ottomans. The left flank galleasses are deployed, the center galleasses are deployed, but the right flank galleasses are not deployed because they are too slow to row to their position. They had the longest way to go. This is important. Also, uh, have in mind the Ottoman fleet, which was num numerically uh, bigger and also had a bigger reserve. Now, this is the view from another point. Now, the, the north is towards the left. It's just skewed. Remember the position of the land and the north is towards the land. North is to your left side. This is the disposition of the Christian. On the left side, Barbarigo, uh, Don Juan had to take in mind to, to not to <laughs> not to make the Genoese and the Venetian ever meet because they hated each other. So he put the Venetians on the left flank. He put the Genoese, Genoese, Doria is Genoese from Genoa on the right flank. As I said, he was a slow to deploy because he had the longest way to roam. Imagine this situation and try to imagine yourself as a Christian commander. Galeas is like here to disrupt the enemy line. Everything going OK? You hear me? Yes, we hear you well. You can proceed with your presentation. OK, I just wanted to check you. The next step is again very important. Barbarigo, Venetian commander on the uh, left uh, flank. He realized what I mentioned before, that he has a free rowers in his galleys. There were uh, basically also I need to mention that there were some uh, Croatian from the Croatian lands and also from the Slovenian lands galleys in this in this division because parts of the Slovenian coast and the Croatian coast uh, were under the, the influence of Venice at that time. So he decided that his psychological advantage is in the rowers and that he has to push the Ottomans towards the coast because when the coast is closed, everybody will try to escape. He wanted to not to make his galleys close to the coast, not to make his people want to escape. He realized that when fighting goes on and the people are close to the coast, they will just jump from the sea and escape to the coast. So he tried to push the Ottomans towards the coast. In the center, they were just fighting and shooting their cannons. Also have in mind that uh, Gelli probably has the opportunity to fire a cannon once or twice before they clash. So they fire a cannon once, they fire it maybe twice, 
then the galleys clash, and then the infantry fights. If you managed to take a hit or get a hit with those one of two shots, it, it was a great, it was a big deal. It was because a cannon could completely devastate the enemy galley if you get a hit. On the right hand side, now I have like a question or a dilemma for you. Because as I said, the Turkish fleet was numerically superior. The Turkish right hand, or for the Turks, it was the left hand, Ulujali, he decided to exploit this advantage by rowing towards the open sea. So rowing towards our right, and for him it was the left. Because he tried to envelope, I hope you see the mouse pointer, he tried to envelope the Christian fleet from this side. If he managed with his numerically more superior wing to envelop Doria, Christians would be doomed. At this moment, Doria had to make a decision. Imagine yourself in his shoes. You are commanding the right wing, right flank of the Christian fleet. You see the enemy going towards your right, trying to envelop you. What do you do? This is a kind of a rhetorical question. Just try to answer it for yourself. It's not, it's not an official <laughs> questionnaire. Do you stay where you are? Do you attack center from the flank? Do you follow the Ottoman right towards the open sea or something else? Let's go a step back. So, do you stay where you are? Do you move like this to help your center from the flank, ignoring this guy? Do you counter his move towards the open sea by your own move towards the open sea? Or you do something else? Try to answer it for yourself. Doria decided to move towards the flank, towards the open sea. He decided to follow the, the Ottoman moves. Now, there are very uh, big dilemmas about this move. Venetians said, because Venetians hated the, the Genoese, remember that, they said that he was trying to betray the whole fleet, to run away. They, paid, they smeared him in a very bad uh, story, like he was a traitor or, or terror. What other people think is that he actually saved the Christians that day, because if he didn't counter, then he would be enveloped and destroyed and the Ottomans would win the battle. I am inclining to this second opinion. I think that he actually saved the Christian fleet by this move because he prevented this guy from enveloping everybody. Meanwhile, on the left wing, uh, Barbarigo, the original Venetian commander, he died. He was killed by an arrow. But the reserve commander, Nani, he kept on pushing, kept on pushing the Ottoman left flank uh, right flank, for us it was the left flank, towards the coast. And the, the, the people on the, on, the, on the Ottoman galleys, they panicked and they started escaping towards the... They, they just jumped from the ship and escaping towards the coast. In the center there was a big fight with the Ottomans having the advantage. And in the right, I explained what happened. In this phase of the battle, the Venetians who were very motivated on the left flank, completely pushed and annihilated Ottomans towards the coast. It was a big victory on the left flank for the, for the Christian side. In the center, it was pretty much undecided until the reserve, commanded by this guy Bazan, intervened here. But take a look at what happened at the right flank. At the right flank, the guy who went here changed his direction to help the center so he lured the Doria towards the open sea, then changed his direction to attack the center where he perceived that it's going to be a decisive battle. Christians counter with their reserve. Doria also tried to get back and there was a big fight here. Uh, this is the only point in the battle where the Turks, this was a clear Christian victory. This was also a Christian victory. At this point, the Turks managed to get their only victory of the day when Uluj Ali. There was some local fights between 10 groups of galleys here. One of his galleys managed to capture a Maltese galley and escape towards here. This was the only Ottoman victory of the day and the only Ottoman group that escaped. 
He changed direction, attacked here, managed to win a couple of galleys, escaped towards this direction. It's a picture of Ulujali galley uh, uh, capturing uh, one of the Christian galleys and escaping towards the west. So the final result, as you see, a big victory for the Christian League. They lost 16 ships or just 8%. Ottomans lost 214 ships or 76%. The only ships that were not lost, most of the ships that were not lost, were those commanded by Yulu Jali that I described how he escaped. Now let's just get back one slide. And let's again analyze Doria. Doria went countering towards the right, towards the open sea. Then he moved to the center. So most of his ships never participated in the battle. This is what Venetians used in their PR, <laughs> public relations, because Venetians were not only good in, uh, in the maritime things, they were also very good in PR. So they sent out the PR public relations after the battle telling uh, the world about the big Christian victory, blah, blah, blah. But they also didn't fail to mention that Doria betrayed Christians, which is basically not true. Even if his ships didn't fight, he did a very, very important thing by countering the Turkish move, move towards, towards the open sea. Okay, a short analysis of a winning tactics that you never know what will win your battle. You know, sometimes, sometimes there is no lesson in history, which is a lesson in itself. But in this uh, case, we can draw some lessons. Winning tactics were galleasses, as I mentioned, very inventive for the period. So six very big and heavy galleys being rowed in front of your line to disrupt the enemy. The Venetian tactics of Barbarigo on the left flank, pushing Turks to the shore because he knew or expected that their morale will break and they will just try escaping towards the, the coast. Also, the, 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 the intervention of the reserves at the right moment when the, this guy on the Turkish left started attacking center, he countered at the right moment. Dubious tactics for the victory. Spanish infantry, did it really participate? Did it, was it really decisive in a battle? I'm not sure. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Obviously, it's better to have Spanish infantry on your ships than some other <laughs> second-rate infantry, but you never know. Also, opinion on the Doria move is still contentious up to this day. People still discuss whether he was betraying the Christians or did he save the Christians on that day. My personal opinion is that he saved the Christians, but not everybody will agree on that. So, Thank you very much. That was a very short analysis of Lepanto battle. I could go on for hours like this. 